Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Forecast is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This episode of Forecast is brought to you by Squarespace.com, the fast and easy way to create a high quality website or blog. For a free trial and 10% off your new account for six months, go to Squarespace.com and use the offer code Forecast8. And by Netflix. Watch thousands of TV episodes and movies on your PC, Mac, iPad, iPhone, or TV instantly. All streamed directly to you, saving you time, money, and hassle. For your free 30-day trial, go to Netflix.com slash twit. What sort of future do you think we're heading for? How will we live as we slip into the 21st century? Welcome to Forecast episode 86. I'm Tom Merritt. And I'm Scott Johnson. And this is the show where we invite two smart people to join us every week and give us their visions of the future while Scott and I sit here slack-jawed going, wow. Yeah. That's pretty much what no, we get. We get smart people on here. Yeah. They come in and they, they kind of blow our minds, and I don't think today will be any different. we got a couple of uh, great guests happy to have along with us this week. Teresa Ellis, uh, digital marketing and PR for Fleischman Hillard, and the communication <laughs> nerd. Nice to see you again, Teresa. Hey, how's it going? Good to, good to see you. I, I got to know per- Teresa up at uh, PAB, Podcasters Across Borders in Ottawa. So uh, thanks for coming on the show. Yeah, no problem. Happy to be here. And Fraser Antakula, animator and motion designer in Birmingham, United Kingdom, and the designer of uh, one of my wife's favorite T-shirts. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> welcome welcome that's to the a, show. That's, that, that's a great honor. <laughs> It's good to have you along. Can't wait to hear you guys' uh, predictions. Uh, Scott, but uh, as usual, we're going to start oh. with a listener prediction. Always with an email. Um, and we get these at the forecastpodcast.com, don't we, Tom? Forecastpodcast at gmail.com or on the website, like he said, yeah. forecastpodcast.com. Yeah. This one comes from Nathan in Atlanta. He says, I was thinking about the rising cost of food as well as the issue of CO2 emissions. My thought is that humanity will figure out how to modify and combine plant DNA to our own. We will then have the ability to absorb all the nutrients and chemicals we need directly from the earth and our surroundings. We will have specialized cells capable of producing energy in a similar way to photosynthesis. Just like plants, we too will take in CO2 and breathe out oxygen, thus helping to counterbalance CO2 emissions. However, we will eventually have the opposite problem we have now, and there will be too much oxygen and not (laughs) enough CO2 in the atmosphere. But we can cross that bridge when we come to that uh i've never had anyone write into the show and suggest we're going to become plants no and also i don't one problem with this prediction is i fear the super vegetarians that will come and eat the people that come from this but (laughs) the the idea that we're all going to be plant-based basically isn't a isn't a terrible idea i feel like that's maybe uh a, a solution or at least a idea be it be it a bit of a crazy ass one but it's an idea how to deal with our energy crisis and how we consume things, I think that's not bad. Teresa, would you go for the uh, for the plant surgery that, that allowed you to breathe in CO2? Uh, you know, I'm not sure. I, I Now that you bring up the vegetarian thing, I'm, I am a little concerned. Yeah, nobody wants to be yeah. in the next salad. <laughs> no, they don't. Yeah. Fraser, how do you feel about the uh, the future of uh, man-plant and our, and, our, and our eventual union, according to this reader? That's almost like a flip of, uh, you know, kind of life in itself. I mean, are we going to have, uh, what, what are the plant, uh, like me eating plants going to turn into then? Are they going to start eating, I don't know, uh, are they going like to Venus switch to them? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> What's going to happen to them? Yeah. Well, we <laughs> have gonna, to have go. Well, we have to have giant bees go from person to person to get our, uh, you know, the, to to sort of impregnate one another. How's that <laughs> all going to go? Yeah, it's getting confusing now. So. Yeah, porn's yeah. going to look really weird. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I, you know, the cool thing about this prediction, in all seriousness, is the idea of being able to pr- take that sort of idea of photosynthesis and incorporate that so that we don't have to eat. I, I don't think we'll ever breathe in CO2 and breathe out oxygen necessarily, uh, but some sort of genetic modification that allowed us to produce our own energy so that we don't have to produce as much food. 
Yeah, and I wonder, I wonder if there's a way, does it have to be plant-based? Can we come up with other ways to produce our, inter, or our own energy? Could we become genetically altered so that we're solar creatures? And I guess that's essentially what a plant is, is doing. Yeah, but yeah is there it would necessarily is, have to be uh, chlorophyll yeah. that does it, though. You're right. Yeah, because the picture I have is that we've got leaves and now we're like swamp people and, and I can't get that out of my head. And I'm not saying that that's definitely a side effect of this, but there will be side effects. The reason things are green have to do with photosynthesis and the kind of, you know, uh, uh, the word just left me. I knew it in science. Don't, don't know it now. But all these kinds of things that plants need to do, we don't necessarily want to dig, you know, we don't want to plant our feet in earth all day and, you know, soak in nutrients that way. There are a lot of things plants do besides you know, process sunlight. So I, I think we have to refine that down to whatever the, you know, whatever the basis can be for us to be relatively human still, but have some new source of energy to at least augment, if not replace our, you know, existing need for food. Teresa or Fraser, either one, uh, what, what do you think of this idea of incorporating energy producing cells within us? That likely? You know, it, it might, it might happen. There could be a way for us to you know, um, you, the idea that you, as we move, you know, we create energy and maybe that could be somehow recycled into us, sort of kinetic energy, you know, you never know. Something like that could work. Yeah, we could just recapture our own motion. Maybe if uh, we, could, uh, we could somehow maybe have uh, some sort of leaves hanging out from our body parts or something that absorb light and we could still be humans, but with some weird additions, you know, genetically modified to, you know, absorb oxygen and stuff like that. So just yeah, fashion, knows. Make, a, make a fashion <laughs> statement out of it, you know, make it so it looks good. That leaf hanging off my back is not, you know, a, a problem. It's a fashion statement. Tom. No, this exactly, you know, this is a, it actually helps the environment as well. So, you know, <laughs> it gives a whole new meeting to the new fall fashions. Oh, yeah. <laughs> All right, let's get into our short-term predictions. These are things you think will happen sooner rather than later, maybe in the next few years. And, uh, Teresa, we'll start with you. What do you got for us? Okay, so my first prediction, I was thinking about how the advent of technology has been sort of creating fewer opportunities for people to practice their handwriting because you're always typing and you're always, like, um, you know, sending messages via your keyboard or something like that. So I was thinking that this might lead to an eventual breakdown of handwriting and then eventually, more specifically, the disappearance of the signature completely for like documents and things. I think it'll, we can sort of move towards like fingerprinting or some kind of biotech identification where we won't have to actually write anything anymore and it'll just be all through your body. That's interesting, Teresa, because uh, today I signed for a package from the UPS guy. And my signature was less of a signature and more of a smear. And, it, and really, it did not, there was no telling who just signed that. And they always ask you for your, for your name. So they don't even believe you, even if you do a good signature on that machine. I've, all, I've wondered for a long time why we still care about, about signatures. But on the other side, I do know, or at least I think I know why we care about handwriting. Um, I have this fear that permeates through all forecast episodes, keeps coming up now and again, that there'll come a day when we have gotten so locked in digitally and we've stored everything in, in virtual space that doesn't really exist if a calamity big enough destroys it all. We're not going to have much in the way of records that, uh, you know, show language, that show writing, that show styles of writing. I mean, cursive mm -hmm. alone is already, you know, this antiquated thing. And I've got kids now who type most of the time, whereas when I was their age, I, I wrote most of the time. But, you know, since maybe age 17 or so, I haven't done much other than type from, for most of the time. So, yeah, we're typing on paper sometimes. Sure, we're printing stuff out. But I feel like this is, you know, if you could go back in time and find a lost civilization, the losing of their language and or their, their ability to communicate their history uh, probably ran into similar problems. I'm not saying it was digital, but, you know, they, they didn't expect something to happen that did that wiped out everything they had, all of their you know, records. Like the burning of the library at Alexandria? Kind of, yeah. yeah. Kind of that idea, except in this case, yeah. we're talking about bits and bytes that could just be wiped out in a second. And maybe there's so much of it that we're not worried, but it, it does concern me. So, Teresa, how do you, how do you respond to that? What, it, what, is, what do the, the nations of the world today do to preserve, you know, French and English and and these languages in all of their forms, if, especially if we're not writing them and keeping journals, you know, by hand anymore? Uh, 
Gosh, I don't actually know. <laughs> I was thinking, I think that my concern is similar to yours and thinking about just what Tom mentioned, the disappearance of like whole volumes of history because they were written down and there was no oral like uh, passing down of the story. So maybe it comes down to really just an oral tradition and re reviving the oral tradition that used to exist so strongly in, you know, Aboriginal cultures and, and sort of is sort of dying out on its own there, but maybe we should focus on telling stories and making sure that we're passing down the knowledge that we need from one generation to the next verbally. In some ways, that's kind of what we're doing now because we don't print as much and, and it's, it's, re, it's reducing finally. There was actually a spike in printing for a while. Uh, paperless office was sort of a joke, but we really have moved past printing a lot of things and we're going into this sort of it's not oral history exa exactly, but social uh, networking and and, mm -hmm. and everything is 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 kind is kind of an uh, an or it has the same pattern as oral history, even though it's written, it's it's kind of transient and and you're passing along your story to to multiple people and and kind of getting it out there. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Teresa, I was going to ask you. So you're a communications nut, so yeah. this seems like it fits right in with with not only your prediction but with your. Uh, sort of your general line of thinking. Is it, I mean, it, when is it too late for us to figure out that we have to buckle down and, I don't know, employ more traditional forms of communication? Or do we at all? Is this fear of mine even based on anything? Is it, are we okay to just keep doing it the way we're doing it? And if not, you know, how, how likely is it that we're going to lose our ability to communicate in the future? Oh, um, I don't know if it's, I think we're probably doing okay. I think, like Tom said, the um, the advent of social networking and sharing with more people has protected us. It sort of adds a layer of protection because now, you know, if things disappeared, well, you've probably told that story to someone else and, and you've talked about it with other people and that knowledge is out there in the world. Um, I think though it is a concern that one day, you know, a giant, magnet falls on planet earth and everything gets deleted right. what happens then <laughs> you don't want all your eggs in one basket fraser I, I, do, do you fear that eventually if we lose the ability to write to hand write that we we risk losing the ability to to communicate effectively yeah i mean it's a shame because i think maybe our uh, cave paintings are going to be cds you know that's what the legacy we're leaving some 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 digital format which won't be easily accessible so anyone kind of digging for the past, um, that's going to be a bit of a difficult kind of thing to to kind of carry on, carry over to the future generation, especially if something comes over and wipes it all out. So, yeah, that is a big concern, and I, I don't really know how we could fix that unless we print everything, you know, from the internet, which is again too much information. Or that, and that could yeah. burn. Yeah, sure and, can. and that can be, yeah. A tiny little piece of me wants all this to, to fall apart so that there is somebody a thousand years from now who've built back up some society from the rubble and now they have no idea what we were doing but they're digging three or four layers down in the, in the crust of what was left from the aftermath and they're finding weird iPhones and Android phones and strange video game consoles and controllers and weird technology that they had no idea you know, was around, but they don't know what the usage. And then, and then I want to see them try to explain it and try to figure out what this ancient people did, you know, with a, with a curling iron or something and, and figure out what that's all about. I would love to be able to witness that uh, at some point. It'd be fun, yeah. no, it'd be fun yeah. to put it together, wouldn't it? Just yeah, to see how they can yeah. piece it together. What, what's this all yeah. about? The gods of these people were round and mirrored with holes in the middle. <laughs> they worshipped mandala symbols. Exactly. <laughs> All right, Fraser, let's move it over to you for your short-term prediction, something you think happens sooner rather than later. What do you got for us? All right, I think uh, in the next couple, of, well, next generation or so, privacy as we know it will kind of disappear. Um, you know, you see kind of on the internet now, we have facial recognition and everyone's kind of, trying to hold on to that grasp but the kids today don't really we won't you know, be able to write secret lives. notes anyway because of the handwriting so well <laughs> that's gone yeah it's out of the window the kids today are growing up with phones and internet and they don't really have the same concerns we have of kind of protecting that 
you know, exposure out there. So I think it's just the, pri the whole privacy factor will just vanish. Wow. So, Frazier, here's a question for you. We, this comes up on the show all the time. Our, 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 we're going to lose our ability to have any kind of privacy anymore. And sometimes yeah. I just say, fine, whatever, I'm ready, let's go. And other times I kind of go, eh, maybe not so much. Let's slow this, this train down. Do, how, what are the negative impacts of this? Like, what, if someone just said to you, I'll say it now, Frazier, what if, if this happens and you lose your ability to have any privacy, what are, what well, are the ramifications? What's bad about that? It basically makes sure that you have to be responsible for everything you say and put out there. That's, uh, there's no kind of code names or hidden pathways you can take. You know, your, your IP address is already exposed at this stage. So when people have that and your photos and your address and everything else, you pretty much, your identity exists out there. So you have to just be responsible. You have to take care of your identity on there, on the internet. So that is quite a daunting thing if you want to do something dodgy, whatever that might be. You know? True, true. But if everybody, see, this is what the point I wanted to get to is if everybody's got that same level of, of privacy or that same lack of privacy, doesn't yeah. that level the playing field and make it so it doesn't really matter? Like, for example, sure, you could flub up and say something you didn't mean to say and then go delete it, but people saw it, so now they know you said it. But that's going to be true everywhere. Like, everybody will be under those yeah. same, same sort of uh, restrictions. So, does that make it any better or does that make it actually worse? <laughs> What do you think? It, it might it might result in a like a change in culture and society. Maybe some of those things won't be viewed as negative anymore. You know, like I said, if if people are on the same playing field, we might just be, hey, you know, fine, he's he's that guy, he's done that and he said that, but we we're not gonna judge him or we have no problems. That's kinda one out the uh, outcome. Or it could just kind of flip and have a direction where, I don't know, everyone's just gets uh, rounded up for saying even the most minuscule thing, you know. So because he, you know, the authorities are clamoring, clamoring down on Twitter, kind of lately. You know, you can't have any in, in, injunctions or anything like that. So there's so many cases where they're trying to get information. So, mm. You know, it could, it could go either way. Well, the standards of privacy have changed over time, and they even change from place to place uh, on on the planet. So, in some sense, it's really just about redefining what we think is important to be private and, and what not. And we're in the process of technology forcing us to change that because some things that used to be hideable just by accident are too easily discovered now. We, ha we have to adjust. Uh, Teresa, do you, do, are you worried, does this worry you or do you think we'll, we'll come to some sort of equilibrium? Uh, I think we'll probably reach some kind of equilibrium mostly because, like you said, it's forcing us to Basically, the way privacy is moving is forcing us to choose what exactly we think of and what we need to be private versus what's kind of okay. And I think it's different for different generations, of course. Like, for example, my dad will never be on Facebook because he just doesn't think that that's a good idea. But, um, you know, I think now we're being forced to really decide, you know, when I'm outside in what feels like I'm alone, I'm possibly not alone and someone's watching me and that can be a safety feature. It can also be a privacy invasion. So we need to sort of decide as a culture and figure out what's important to us. Well, so here we are living on an age where Tom and I and you two, we're all sitting around talking and we may say something. I may say something that I don't know. And let's say in eight years is suddenly offensive. Right now it isn't, but for whatever reason, sensitivities change and in eight years they hear me say this thing in some archive of this show, how responsible should I be for that? See, that's the part that scares me. I'm not so scared mm -hmm. about the current level of privacy or loss of privacy. It's the taking stuff out of context, whether it be context of time or context of conversation or whatever, taking that out and using that against somebody years from now um, or even months from now or even right now. Um, it seems like if we're going to be if we're going to be this much more open, society is going to have to be this much more ready to, uh, to be accepting of opinions, to be less reactionary about something somebody said, and to understand that that is, that is some of the fallout of having this kind of openness. And I, that part, I don't know where that comes from. Maybe that just comes you know, slowly over time. 
Tom, I love hearing you. You always have great opinions when it comes to, to privacy issues. It, is it, do you, is that even an issue? Have I made that up in my head to be a problem, that, and it's not really a problem? I think we adapt to this stuff faster than maybe we'd like to admit. Uh, you know, think about people moving from situations where they had fairly private residences, right, into big cities uh, where everyone is packed together. It's you know, on the grand scheme of things, a fairly recent phenomenon that people live together in such great numbers right next to each other where you can hear everything going on in the room next to you, right? You know generally what your neighbors are up to, uh, at least if, if they're loud about it. And, and so that's, that's a different level of privacy that we've gotten used to. If you'd gone to, to folks uh, who were used to living in sort of a pastoral setting uh, with, with you know, their residences separated by large amounts of space, and said, you know what we're going to do is we're going to put you all in these apartment buildings and you're going to live right next to each other and you're going to share walls. I think people would freaked out the same way people are freaking out about the, pri the different uh, privacy situation on the Internet because they're used to it being a certain way and there's certain things that they want to be private just because they've always been private. Uh, but, but folks adapt, right? And, I, and yes. I think some of those things, you know, I don't know what the, uh, the suburbs of the Internet would be. Some people choose to just move away from that and not deal with it, and, and, and some people adapt to it. Yeah, maybe yeah, they I just think, don't uh, use it. Maybe that's how they move away. Go ahead, Fraser. Sorry, I was saying, yeah, Tom's kind of nailed it there, I think, because society will find a way, and the people who are sort of still stuck in the same kind of mannerisms, they might just decide to bail, you know, they, they won't get involved, you know, hey, I won't post on the internet then, if that's the case, so eventually, if you do want to get involved, you will have to sort of blend in, you know, with the rest of this, with, uh, the society as a whole. Yeah. All right, let's take a uh, quick break and thank our sponsor, Squarespace.com. You've heard us talk about them before. Easy to use UI for creating and managing a website or blog. We use them for forecast. Uh, and Chad, I don't know if you got it, my, uh, do you have my, my screen up? Uh, no, we don't. Because I, what I could do right now, if you could see it, uh, is I could ask Scott on the forecast website: Should the search be on the right or the left, Scott? Well, normally I'd say, Tom, why do you want to go through so much hard work just to move something from the left to the right? It's like I'd be wrong about that. It's like four <laughs> clicks. I go, I go into, I go into the architecture of website management. It gives me the layout, and I just drag one across. Like if I want the search to be on the sidebar two, I just drag it over there. Done. Search is now on the sidebar two. If Scott goes, why'd you move search over there? You, I want it on the left side, up at the top. Boom. I just move it back. It's done. It's that easy. And now I can get in there and edit. Oh, here, here. You want the search on the right or the left, Scott? Uh, left. Okay. Oh. Uh, Wait, did, oh, I left? put it on the right. Do you want it on the left? Oh, oh, I'll oh put it, shoot. I'll put yeah, it back. Left. There. Yeah. Okay. I'll leave it on the left. Navigation oh. on the right, though? That should be on the left, right? Yeah, probably on the left. All right. Let's change that. Uh, and then, well, now, now we've got a really long left column, so I'm just going to balance it out. I'm going to put this stuff over here. Oh, all right. yeah. There. And now I just go back here, and it's all saved. I didn't have to press save. I didn't have to do anything like that. I just... Oh, and Chrome crashes on me. <laughs> that's, that's not Squarespace's fault. But see, yeah, that's there a thing. Chrome crashes, but look, search is on the left. Navigation's on the left. Everything, everything is good. Actually, I put, I put that back over there on the right. But that's as easy as it is. You just drag things right and left, put them where you want them. Squarespace.com is fast and easy, and I love using it. So check them out. Go to Squarespace.com and sign up for a free account. You don't need a credit card or anything. You can sign up right now. Give them a shot, and if you decide to purchase it, use the code FORECAST8. It's F-O-U-R-C-A-S-T-8, and you'll get 10% off for six months. We thank them for their support of Forecast Podcast. And thanks, Chad, for being able to get that screen up. Appreciate that. All right, let's move on to our long-term predictions. And, uh, Fraser, we'll stick with you. Uh, when you look longer-term, maybe more like 100 years, what do you see? Well, I think uh, scientists have been trying to well, work with bacteria and bacterial cultures sort of to play with fossil fuels. And I think uh, that technology will kind of get better in time and we won't actually need to abandon the planet, you know, as many people might fear in the future. You know, we will find a way to recycle what we have and kind of consume, the, you know, the waste that we're producing now. So those systems will get more efficient as uh, cultures evolve. I mean, we, as we generate cultures that can 
you know, consume that stuff quicker and better, you know, so we won't be making too much waste and we won't have to leave the planet. So, <laughs> so, so uh, um, that's good that we don't have to leave the planet for at least another hundred years because that's been uh, <laughs> a real concern of some. But um, uh, I, I heard somebody was talking about algae-based uh, fossil fuel and that you, you would yeah. speed up the process. It basically, it's like making a cubic zirconia out of a, out of, you know, instead of a diamond. It's really, it's still a diamond, but since you hurried up the process, it's a lot cheaper. Nobody cares about it because it's not this rare thing that happens naturally in nature. Do you think that this will translate to cheaper fuel costs generally because it'll be so artificial and so quick, we don't have to wait for some dinosaur to decay and, you know, for us to refine the oil thousands of years later, or millions really? How, would, how do you see that? I think, I think that's the whole point. It will be sort of everything kind of just waste, plastic or any materials that need millions of years to naturally get uh, break, broken down could be done faster, you know, with these bacteria. So you just kind of farm these out, put your, your stuff in there and you just, you know, in a, t in a week's turnaround or something, you have a fresh flow of all fossil, I mean, oils and anything, gases, kind of natural gases and anything we might need. So we, we, we're kind of getting rid of uh, nature in a sense and kind of taking it under our own control. So that technology will help us solve today's problems really. So you'll have you'll be able to burn oil without emitting carbon dioxide, possibly. That would be that would be a plus. <laughs> I like Scott your so, idea too. Uh, it, would it become a status symbol to burn real gas instead of the synthetic <laughs> gas? Well, that's kind of <laughs> what I was what I was kind of getting at, and I wonder if also we might see spring up because my daughter the first thing she said when uh, we were talking about this around the dinner table we were talking about fossil fuel and about algae and about you know microbes and stuff like this and she says well then you're just aren't you killing life to make gas because she's a hippie and she loves that you know she doesn't want to see the, the chicken i'm eating on my t table just disgusts her she can't stand it when animals or any kind of living creature has to suffer and so we always have these interesting conversations about all of that my guess is we'll see some of that spring up there's always going to be some reason somebody somewhere is going to hate this idea it's going to have some other impact we can't think of right now but as a whole, what I read and what I hear about the where we are with this technology today and what it could potentially do, um, I think it's I think it's awesome. The worry I have is that the current day establishment does not let it out of the gate, and that's very conspiratorial of me, and that's very you know spy movie of me. But I just see major big oil and big government and everybody else kind of kiboshing this before it happens too soon. Now, maybe 100 years is enough for us to stretch that out, but that needs to be a nice, gradual, slow burn. And I feel like we need it sooner than that. So that's, that remains my concern. Teresa, do you think, you think government and, 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 and uh, you know, big money are gonna let us uh, change the way we consume oil in this cleaner, better, faster way? Uh, I hope so. I mean, I hope that someday that we can, you know, avoid all these crazy political type issues when it really comes down to our ability to continue living the way that we do live. Um, can I just say, though, that no joke that uh, Frazier's uh, prediction is very, very similar to my uh, crazy prediction, oh. where I talked about oh. how there was there would be no such thing as garbage in the future. <laughs> and that that everything will be reused and repurposed and transformed so that you know, we'll finally figure out how to have like a net zero production process. And I was just thinking like, I want to see a Mr. Fusion, like a Back to the Future Mr. Fusion created that everyone has in their house so that whenever you're making whatever, like making your food, you've got waste, you've got package waste, all that stuff. We figured out a way to break it down and transform it into a great source of renewable energy because even though there's no like we're not going to call it garbage we really are producing waste no matter what we do so you know i it was very interesting <laughs> fraser what do you think i mean should this be a crazy prediction or you, you you seem to think it's long term but it's it's achievable i have a crazy prediction at hand so yeah in okay. 100 years <laughs> we can handle uh <laughs> we can, we can handle uh you know just to clarify, I was thinking it's crazy because I'm a little doubtful that it would happen in 100 years, but maybe maybe we could extend it to be like 500 and hopefully that will be the future. 
All it's, right. it's still, it's weird to me that we haven't just figured out a way to melt stuff down and burn it again. And I know that isn't uh, simple, and I know that I'm just Well, we way... have figured out how to melt stuff down and burn it, just not to get an appreciable <laughs> amount of energy out of it. <laughs> right, I right. To, and I guess that's the part I'm talking about. I used to get in trouble with my, from my dad because I'd, I'd take trash and burn it in the fireplace just, you know, because I wanted to watch the milk carton melt because it was cool looking and he's like you can't do that it emits weird stuff and it's bad for the fireplace and stop uh, it's just you're, garbage you'll get, you'll get black lung and all that sort of thing yeah we, we couldn't burn uh, styrofoam plates at camp for the same reason we always scout masters are like we're all you will everyone will die and we'll kill the earth if you burn those things but i i just i don't know i just feel like this should be closer than 100 years from now i feel like we're we've been on the cusp of this for too long and i hope mm -hmm. fraser's prediction comes to in the next 10 <laughs> Can we do that? That'd be great. All right. Well, Teresa, we, we need to get your long-term prediction then. Uh, yeah. So uh, when you when you look more in the uh, the flying car sort of direction, what do you see? So what I was seeing um, is the evolution of what I kind of call sort of an immersive media, where you're sort of fully embedded in the experience of communication, and we're kind of seeing that starting out now, but. I think that in a hundred years, we're going to see like the full embedding of people into, you know, movies. It's like virtual reality, but kind of even more than that, where you're actually, you, you know, you're smelling the things that are happening, you're tasting the air and you're in this whole new place where communication is transformed into your experience. and. I think that's going to be sort of the key thing for how we're going to start to learn about the world education in the future, I think, will be based on this type of model where we're going to send the kids and have them be fully immersed in this new kind of world where because they won't maybe they won't have the chance to be out there learning about it firsthand. Uh, maybe those things don't exist anymore. We're putting them in the situation. We're giving them that sort of firsthand experience. But it's not really firsthand. It's mediated, but it's very immersive, very much like being there. And that's what I thought would be exciting in 100 years. So just correct me if I'm wrong, but this maybe presents opportunities for people to I mean, I'm, I'm trying to think of an holodeck? example. If I, Are you just holodeck? Yeah, ho yeah, yeah, yeah. Holodeck's a great idea, actually. It's a great concept of how this would be. Because right now, it's go and sit in an auditorium and look at a PowerPoint, listen to a dude, and then go home. And I would love, as much as, you know, Star Trek got weird with the holodeck sometimes, I would love the idea of being able to go and experience the thing I'm, I'm meant to be learning, to smell what it was like to be on the front lines in this particular battle in World War II, you, and you to know what that looked smell. like and felt like. That would be amazing. I probably don't want to, but you know what I mean? I mean, the, a true education would be, wow, war is hell. This was terrible. Uh, look what these guys did. They're super heroic. Those guys are jerks, you know, whatever, and really walk away with a sense of, of time, place, and, and, and all that that you normally don't get from a, uh, you know, a, a lecture or a lesson. I like this idea a lot. Yeah, I like it too. Fraser, what, what do you think? Do you, want the, uh, do you want the holodeck experience as Teresa is describing it, the sort of immersive uh, ability? Well, you, you said it's immersive media, so it's not, just, uh, it's not just movies or TV shows. It can be anything. It's that, definitely. I mean, smell vision, we're bringing that back. <laughs> so... Uh, <laughs> It's, it's it's a whole full, you know full experience where you can learn you know everything so sort of just plugged in maybe straight to your brain and you know that's a way it, I was thinking maybe taking it even further it could be a way to actually even that's how people fight wars in the future or um, even go to school then and you know you, you just do it all from home or just plug yourself in and you log into this universe or you know, or an experience, a game, or driving simulation, skydiving. If you know, if you don't want to actually go out and do it, so that, that makes sense to get all these range of experiences. You know, if if maybe there's a historical landmark that was destroyed 100 years ago, you could go and visit it and watch a museum or something. Maybe that could fix our uh, our writing problem. So, <laughs> so so Teresa, if I'm um, if I'm Let's say this, because here's the problem with the holodeck and all these other kind of ideas. People are going to abuse them. Um, they're not going to get used. Like the, the the Deep Space Nine usage of the holodeck was a lot more realistic, I think. They kind of used games. it as, yeah, it was more, well, there was some of that. But 
also in Quark's <laughs> bar, he was using it for, you know, uh, this yeah. little pleasure palace thing that everybody would come and use. And I got to thinking that's probably how these things are going to get used and abused. And, and higher learning and higher experience and all this doesn't seem like it'll be the, the thing that will motivate people. Is there anything about this prediction that you could say would be the defining, the, the thing about it that would be the most compelling as an educational experience or a learning experience rather than just an escapism or a place to go and, and meet fake girls or whatever? <laughs> um, I think that the most compelling piece for this, at least in my mind, would be the idea that, I guess, kind of take a step back and just think about what people are experiencing now and the experience of education as it is and things that maybe you got to experience that your kids didn't have the chance. So, for example, like learning uh, about plants and animals that maybe don't exist anymore and like what Fraser was saying, going to visit those old places where there's really important learnings to achieve just by really being there. I, I don't know. I guess it's it's not a fully thought out prediction, but you know, I think that it could be just the idea of being there when otherwise you would never have been able to could be a huge learning component. And I think even specifically for like um, environmental education, where you get to um, you get to experience what it's like to play outside or be in the jungle or um, even just like climb a tree when let's say you live in a city and there aren't any trees to climb, this could be like a great way of getting people to develop relationships with, you know, nature or, or what have you and sort of develop that bond so that they can, they can keep those things to be important to their hearts and, and uh, make everything nice and pretty and green in the future. <laughs> Well, prob probably, uh, I mean, it'd probably do two things. Like if you pulled them into war scenarios, that would probably help deter people, deter people from going to war in the first place. Um, if you could relive those, you know, those horrors and be in, in Vietnam and feel it and be there and all that, even the sensation of being shot or something and, and having to go to a, a you know, medivac or something, whatever, all of those kinds of experiences would probably teach us that, man, that's a terrible thing. And even though I'm so many generations removed from that, I can still learn from what, should have been learned and that's that this is a terrible conflict and then maybe you'll learn from other wars that okay well this one as horrible as it is this was done for these f five reasons and they turn out to be very noble reasons or reasons that needed to happen or whatever and you could argue world war ii had some of that going for it and others but i, I think that would be good but also on the other hand it would maybe encourage us to be more in touch with things that let's say trees disappear in 100 years they're just gone we've we've used them up we're living underground now and all we have left is this weird holodeck that we can then go back and sort of appreciate the extinct trees. Uh, that seems like a great way to stay, I guess, connected to who we once were. Of course, it so, could also um, be used for yeah. ill, right? I mean, it could be yeah. used to convince people that something that is a good idea is bad because you change, you know, you're, you're in control of the reality in something like this. Uh, so, you know, mm -hmm. you, you can immerse people in, in a lie, so to speak. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and I, the thing that came to mind when I was coming up with sort of this thing was the Matrix and how that kind of went bad in yeah. some ways. And we could be there right now. We could be. This is in all fact, a dream. There's a 20% chance you're living in a simulation. <laughs> it actually has been determined statistically. 20%? Yeah. Wow. Wow. I don't, like, I, don't like those, I don't like those odds at all, Tom. Yeah. That makes me nervous. I know. Well, there's an 80% chance you're not. Oh, all right. Think of it that way. Well, when that's, you put it that much way. Better. Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, now, Teresa, you kind of gave us your crazy-ass prediction. Well, uh, I did have a backup. Okay, yeah. Um, let's hear your backup. So, my backup one, and I'm, I'm all for, like, I love uh, sort of the whimsical part of history and sort of legend and mythology. So, my crazy prediction, crazy, crazy, is that all of the sort of little creatures like fairies and dwarves and these types of sort of mythological creatures do still exist they're in hiding and in a thousand or two thousand years when we're all gone they all come back wow planet of the fair fairies and wood <laughs> well they we That's... turn ourselves into plants and they probably just eat us right <laughs> yeah I knew that. I knew that one was going to come back, but I didn't quite know how. That's a great, a great connection. But so, so really, this the whole fantasy realm. We talking dragons and 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 all sorts of mystical creatures, like dudes with a horse for a body and a dude for a, 
for a head or whatever. What's the, what are those called? Centaurs. Anyway? Centaurs. Oh, centaurs. I, yeah. Are we going to see all that stuff come back? Um, I was really thinking more of the smaller ones that could easily be hidden, uh, that you that could maybe be invisible sometimes. They have little magical type yeah. powers of, of sort of disappearing quickly without you noticing. Kind of like when you're in a forest and you think someone's watching you, but you're sure that no one's there. That sort of feeling, I think that it's kind of still, it still happens to me anyways when I'm in the forest or if I'm walking through a path and I, you know, sometimes you just kind of get that uh, that feeling. So why why is it, I mean, we don't really know for sure, do we? Well, no biologically knows. speaking, is supposedly, that is just your your defense mechanism to kind of over-interpret being watched. So if there is a predator after oh. you, you'll, you'll catch on to it. That doesn't mean they're not watching. Uh, no, that's true, but I, I was going for a more magical feeling there. There was some whimsy <laughs> happening. <laughs> or it could be there's Fra just a Fraser, lot of what do you, uh, what's your take on the future of uh, fantasy creatures back in our lives? I think that anything is possible in that scenario. I mean, <laughs> if you have, <laughs> sorry, if you I have, told you uh, it was crazy. <laughs> well, that's that's the point. I think that's Fraser true. knows no, more about this than he's letting on. Yeah, that like is back. blown my mind. I, I think I feel like I'm being watched right now. <laughs> to be you are by about 730 people. <laughs> oh, well, the 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 cool thing about and the, no spoilers here, and I don't even mean to really bring this up, but in this new Planet of the Apes movie, which plenty of people have seen and many of <gasps> haven't, so again, no spoilers. There's but no there's fans. the theory about man's downfall and the there's actual sometimes. rise of the apes is really cool. Um, I like the t the, the the take they took. And, I, and Tom, I know you've seen it, but I'll just say this. There's no reason why that same sort of scenario couldn't work in the fairies are coming out of the woods well, scenario. And, and, and I know I, I, I kind of have the same idea as Teresa. When you, and when you say it, and that's why she's being very careful to say this is crazy. People are like, oh, yeah, the fairies are coming. Uh -huh. <laughs> but I think, if you know, if you think about it, there may be other animals uh, or even sentient uh, creatures that are good at hiding and uh we might not have been able to detect yet uh you know that that could explain a lot of things like extraterrestrial visitations i'm not saying that's likely that's why it's crazy ass prediction but you know i think i think that makes a, a good story is that you know that we do have areas of the world deep in the ocean deep in the forest that are unexplored still we we kind of think oh we've watched you know we've gone up into space we've seen everything but you know there are corners uh, of the world where there might be some unknown things there so who knows yeah there's a there's a hill full of ants in my backyard when i walk past it over it <clears throat> or near it has no idea that i'm there that i exist that i represent a threat they have no idea no idea at all oh they so know. i always wonder is that what is around me somewhere yeah. that is huge and i just look I, I don't even see it because i'm an ant on my hill i just have a more advanced hill than the ants in my backyard and it and that that never that thought never quite leaves me <laughs> i always think about that fraser mm -hmm. what's your crazy ass prediction when you look really far out there will we all be made of cheese someday I uh, wish, you know, we were, but um, mine is pretty much, uh, well, scientists, are, some scientists have been talking about uh, evolution sort of slowing down, but I think we're actually making it speed up in a sense that, um, you know, we don't need a natural selection, mutation, or kind of random change to take place anymore. We actually affect it ourselves directly. So in a million years or whatever, we'd, we would just become something completely different uh, the graph will just literally become exponential of how fast we are actually changing. We're not seeing the effects now, but they are actually happening. You know, diseases that get that needed like generations to get eradicated through that natural selection. You know, get you know he healable in ten years. So stuff like that makes it makes us more survival. So survival it gives us a more chance of survival and just enhances us. You know, we're living longer. We're just getting more efficient at doing everything. So later on, we'll, we'll probably be super, super humans, super people. Or centaurs. Know. Yeah, or centaurs. <laughs> or, yeah. <laughs> that could actually or, explain what happens. We just evolve into them. Yeah, yeah. man on top, horse on bottom. I'm telling you, though. So, okay, let's say it's speeding up. How, how much is it speeding up? In other words, if right now it takes me, I don't know, 10 years of, or 10 million years of natural selection to grow a tail... What, in your compression rate, how quickly will I have a tail in a million or years? Or in your case, lose a tail. Right. <laughs> as, as humans have lost our tails. 
<laughs> my vestigial tail. When does that leave? No, but I mean, you know what I'm saying? Like, if the time's really compressed, yeah. how much is it compressed? How quick will we see the changes? I mean, I was thinking more when cell phones started popping up, people were saying, oh, everyone's going to develop bigger thumbs. But I feel like that that wasn't necessary. We've sort of skipped that already. So natural selection didn't even need to worry about that. We've kind of moved on to the next thing. So we sort of just keep, we're going through these paces faster than we needed to, to sort of sit down and absorb them and figure them out. We don't need to take ages to, you know, natural selection doesn't need to take ages to figure it out. We just kind of keep moving on to the next thing. So I, I just think some sort of exponential increase, you know, speeding up because uh, we test it out, we figure it out, we, we either implement it or we shun it, but it's happening just a quicker refresh cycle, really. My, my uh, sister has a, a theory she talks about all the time about how we are driven, human beings are typically driven by survival. And because we live in a time and, a, and, and in societies today where on the large part, we're not constantly facing death from a bear or some other animal uh, or, or a warring tribe. Sure, these things happen in wars and you know, certain parts of the world, but for the most part, we are no longer under that constant threat from, uh, from other creatures. And so we're not constantly having to do our fight and flight. And because of that, a lot of us sort of settle into a nervous that something's gonna happen, but we don't know what kind of routine. And she thinks that the bigger impact on evolution that we'll have if, if our society is to continue the way that they're continuing is the lack of a threat to us, uh, most, to most of us personally, will eventually result in major changes uh, in our humanity. Teresa, does that ring true to you at all? How do you, how do you see the future of, uh, of human evolution? Yeah, I think, um, I think that that last piece where we're getting, we don't have to worry as much, sort of creates this sense of complacency, I don't know, you just kind of get lazy about it. And that could have some really interesting, maybe detrimental um, impacts on on how we as a society as a as a being um, exist. The, uh, the other thing that I was thinking about was that, you know, because of the, the what Frieda was saying, how we, you know, cell phones, they weren't really, they didn't really last long enough for natural selection to, you know, improve the human body to make it more effective I thought about the things that there's not really anything right now that's fixed like there's nothing really other than our our behaviors that that last a long time so like the fact that we sit at a desk and maybe work sitting down um, for most of the day and for most people you know that could be a really have an impact on on what we're going to turn into like maybe we'll lose the ability to kind of walk around or i don't know like it could be it could go crazy well, yeah, we'll we, sort of be waddling everywhere i don't know it's the lack of a selection there, there's you know evolution works by selection pressure anything that gives you a survival advantage tends to you know pr propagate in the species but then there's the removal of a selection pressure which can allow for diversification i mean the the fact that we don't have bears chasing us anymore might allow things to to flower in the human uh, condition that that couldn't have in the past right you know like mm -hmm. if you have three legs you don't run as fast so we get two legs because that's optimal for running maybe I, I don't even know if that's true but just as an example uh, so, so maybe uh, with, without having anything chasing us, all of a sudden we just start getting weirder. Yeah, it just has to be something. It has to be something that has a longer, sustainable period of time that it that it's present in our lives, and that's goes to my sister's theory that it will be this this lack of a of a threat is just going to change our physiology and the way we think with our minds. I don't mean that we're going to get lazy and and that. She she actually thinks that we're still built to be a uh, you know jumpy and, and, and freak out and defend ourselves, but that will be, that will force some other weird mutations. And or maybe nervous people will do stupid things because they're nervous, <laughs> or, the, or they'll jump out of airplanes and looking for thrills, and they'll all die, and, and the really calm people survive, and then the aliens come and wipe us all out because we're too calm. Yeah, they, then they're too calm. So exactly, we're right back to where we started, but it, it's, it is interesting to think that Something like cell phones come and they go, and ways we communicate come and go, and unless one of these things that comes and and then stays, it has to stay for a really, really long time. 
more than thousands of years uh, to have natural selection kick in and go, all right, well, that's had an impact on who survives and who doesn't. Um, and until then, I just don't know what that is. Other, I like her theory, but I don't, you know, it may not hold water either. So I don't know what that thing is. But well, the idea and that we, and if we speed up evolution, like Fraser's talking about, it doesn't take as much time. It's because it's generations. Right. You need number right. of generations. You can evolve yeah. things very fast in bacteria because they generate, they go through generations so fast. Yeah, and they talk about you yeah. know you take ten ten generations of a fox and turn it into a docile house animal, um, from wild mm -hmm. fox to docile house animal because they forced the selection um, by only pulling out the ones that were that were quiet and sweet and putting them together and making more puppies and then doing the same thing 10 times over suddenly you've you've you know evolved an animal in a very short amount of time compared to what it would have to have to happen naturally and i just don't know what else we i don't know what we have in humanity that we can force that way unless we do some terrible terrible thing second nose mm. i feel so, like, i feel like we have a a sort of a, a bigger input to all of this because um we can kind of genetically modify ourselves and that's that actually helps push it forward as well because uh maybe in the future you have uh, enhanced athletes uh like swimmers might have to get webbed you know yeah. webbed fingers and, and, and toes just because that's the way to compete nowadays you know so stuff like that could just make it a, a more extreme sport just because we, we have the technology to do that so you know just um the population might just evolve into other things because we can decide to have that in you know in, in the genes so since we, you know we're, we're already learning how to kind of co read the code of the gene you know we, we, we're trying to de depict uh, aging and things like that so if, if we have more input to that kind of growth and change you know we will speed up the the, the filter pro uh, the will filter um, we won't need uh, natural selection to kick in really because we will be pushing it ourselves Sort of thing. We'll be selecting. It, it'll be unnatural <laughs> selection. Yeah, yeah unnatural yeah. selection. Yeah. <laughs> All right, before we get to four questions, I want to thank our other sponsor for today's show, Netflix.com slash twit. Uh, if you ever watch Scott Johnson's show, Film Sack, you're going to need Netflix to get the most out of it. You can still listen to it and have a great mm -hmm. time, but if you really want to like squeeze every last drop, out of what Scott does, you need Netflix. Netflix.com slash twit will help you enjoy your life more. I could tell you how bad Life Force is, 1985's Life Force, but it's going to be so much better for you to see how bad that movie is on your own. <laughs> so get it. Try it for free for 30 days. You can stream TV and movie shows right to your television, to your laptop, to your phone, to your tap. Any situation you can think of, you can be watching a TV or a movie as long as you have the internet connection and as long as you have Netflix. Netflix.com slash twit. Try it for 30 days free. We thank them for their support of Forecast. It's time for four questions, Scott. Four questions is where we ask our guests four questions, rapid fire style, and we ask them quickly so they do not have time to answer. They can only answer from the gut. Well, they have time to answer, but they have to answer quickly. <laughs> um, I am going to be asking my questions today of Fraser. Fraser, are you sitting comfortably? I uh, hope so. All right, excellent. <laughs> if you had your own hollow deck, what would be the first thing you'd do in there? I would want a simulation of Jurassic Park. I can play around with dinosaurs. Nice. Delete oh, you'd raptors. Oh, you be on the dinosaurs. So, oh, that's cool. D-E-L raptors before you go in. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, make sure you got all the safety stuff in place. Uh, if you get too close, uh, oh, no, I'm sorry. If you get to choose, where would you like your RFID implant implanted? It's going to have to be at the back of my neck. All right. Just, just that's, below it's That's called. a very yeah. sci-fi place for it. I want to put mine where it's embarrassing for an agent of, <laughs> of uh, mischief to find it. Uh, gum that never loses its flavor or artificial steak? Ah. It's going to have to be. <laughs> oh, it's going to have to be the artificial steak. I'm with right. you there. I was going to give you one. Uh, yeah, a third choice could have been gum that tastes like steak that never loses its flavor. Uh, finally, uh, where will sentient machines first spring from? Automated vacuums, your phone, or something else entirely? They're basically going uh, to show up out of vehicles, I think. And after okay. watching Transformers, I think that's where they're coming from. All right. I like that. Idea. Cars. Yeah. Hopefully they're all Autobots. 
Uh, congratulations. <laughs> uh, you have succeeded in four questions. Tom, I turn it over to you, sir. All right, Teresa, are you sitting comfortably? Sure am. Good, then we'll begin. Question number one, will we ever become a cashless society, and how will that work? Oh, yeah, I think we will. Um, I think it'll work on some kind of, like, I guess is, if it's cashless, does it mean creditless? I don't know. But if it's if it's completely cashless, like no paper money or anything, I think it would just be like a return to some kind of weird barter system. But it'd be like information or brain power that you would trade. Uh, I don't yeah. know. Like woofy <laughs> or something like that. Yeah. Question number two. What social network will kill Facebook after it gets done? Or I'm sorry. What social network will kill Google Plus after it gets done killing Facebook? Ooh. <laughs> uh... Gosh, I don't know. I don't think it's probably not created yet, but it'll be something where we can really immerse into the experience of sharing. Just make up a name. What do you think it'd be called? Oh, it's called, um, um, guy, I don't know. How do you spell guy? Called, yeah, it's called guy. Yeah, there you go. G-A-I-E. <laughs> you know what? It sounds silly, but you may not be far wrong. Whoa. Question number three, Stargate. When do we discover it? Um, or do we? I'm going to go with uh, another, like, 75 years or so. All right. They're still discovering those, like, ancient Egypt, like, not the ruins, not in Egypt, but, like, in the jungle and stuff. It could be in there. All right. Fair enough. I'll be gone, but I'm glad somebody gets to see it. And question <laughs> number four, what planet will be the most popular tourist destination and why? Hmm. I'm going to go with um, uh, Jupiter, just because it's got the sort of, that's the gassy one, right? Yeah, great red spot. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> just because it's got all that's those, That's what like, makes it popular? It's the gassy one? There you one? go. Yes, that's... No, I was gonna say I was gonna say it's because it's all the colors. It's pretty, yeah. and that people right. will experience it in that way. Something different, and it's huge. That too. All right. You have completed four questions. Thank you. Okay. And uh, that completes our show. Scott Johnson, mm. can you believe it? We're, we're done with yet another episode of Forecast. Amazing, amazing. Great work by uh, everybody. You guys were awesome as guests. And uh, we don't ever do this very much, but behind the boards today, OMG Chad, knocking it out of the park. Thanks, well man, for all Well done, Che Joe. Yeah. I'm trying to give him a nickname, but it's just not working. Che Joe. <laughs> 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 All right. Well, thank our guest, uh, Fraser Antakula. Uh, thanks for being on Forecast. Let folks know what you do, where they can find out about it. I, um, I'm an animator and motion designer, so I, I make stuff move, basically. Uh, you can find me at uh, FraserAntakula.com and the same thing for Twitter, please. Yeah, so. F-R-A-S-E-R -E for -E Fraser. And then yeah, N-T-U-K-U-L-A.com. That's, yeah, that's me. Excellent. And uh, Teresa, great to see you again. Thanks for being on the show. And let folks know what you're up to and where they can find your stuff on the net. Uh, well, I'm up to all kinds of crazy things. And you can find me on Twitter at uh, Teresa Dawn Ellis, D-A-W-N, and also on Google+. Plus. And I just wanted to say that um, I was really happy that I could use my iPad for this. I heard this was a first for your show. Uh -huh. I didn't realize you were on, you were on Skype on iPad. That's right. Oh, I would have known. Oh, went really known. well. Yeah. Yeah, yeah it's yeah, pretty cool. Awesome. Yeah, it works really well. All right. Well, thanks for blazing a trail for us. <laughs> Got my geek cred. <laughs> Appreciate it. <laughs> Scott, any last words before we go? Uh, no, I just, I did something cool. Uh, if people want to see my Google Plus profile, I made a link for them that's easy. It's at frogpants.com slash plus. It's totally cool. You just go there and boom, you're in my profile in the Google Plus. Now, so people you, should try that Did you that do out. a JavaScript redirect to get that? I or? did not. I did a basic HTML redirect. Just a regular that is as old as the web itself. That, th that file's maybe 1K. <laughs> wow. That's kind of awesome. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So check out frogpants.com slash plus. Was that right? Yeah, that's it. Excellent. Slash plus. And uh, don't forget to leave comments at our website, forecastpodcast.com, or send us an email, forecastpodcast at gmail.com. Till next time, we'll see ya. Bye. It's only 32 years away. Way. So we have two, uh, two competing titles, corn porn or the gassy one? I like the gassy one. <laughs> <laughs> I think uh, the gassy um, one's pretty good.
uh, corn porn just uh, really v- makes me visualize the horrible things. <laughs> you can combine them, corn porn, with the gassy one. Yeah, it could go very wrong <laughs> with, with the corn title. 